somebody that couldn't speak, somebody that couldn't be a witness, was able to be a witness even after they had passed away. James, first of all, uh, what was your juror number? 530. 530, okay. Yes. Um, when you were first called up for jury duty, did you realize it was going to be this case? Um, so I wasn't positive, but we were given a questionnaire, so a lot of those questions kind of pertain to the case in some way. Um, so I didn't know for certain, but I did think that it was going to be this case. When you finally got to court and you realized it was, what were... Is the audio better now that I boosted it? Or should I keep it low and I'll just tell you what the um, inter interrogator, what the interviewer is saying? <laughs> Um, you know, I don't really think I had any thoughts. It was just, I was there to do my civic duty, and I really didn't think that I would be chosen. I had heard that there was like 900 some people that were given, you know, the questionnaire and everything. So out of 900, I didn't really think that I'd be chosen. Was the Murdoch case something that everybody talked about around here, or was it something that was just kind of something that happened? And um, I don't know, what, what is your um, take on that? I think that it was talked about a fair amount, but I didn't, I actually work over in Charleston and I've been up in Clemson uh, at school, so I haven't really been in the area for like the past four years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's something that you hear about, but it, it's not something that I was really, I have so many other things going on, it's not something that I dedicated a lot of my time talking about or paying attention to. Mm -hmm. You said you were, so you went to Clemson? Is yes. Right? Oh, okay. Uh, so, are, you graduated? Yeah. Okay, how, can I ask how old you are? 22. Oh, okay. He's 22? Oh my god, he's so young. <laughs> I guess he could look 22, but maybe the facial hair makes him look a little bit older. <laughs> oh my gosh, so you're around Paul Murdoch's age. Yeah, well, I would have been the same age as him in 2021, as far as whenever he passed away. Wow. Um, so, let's talk about the verdict. Um, what, how, you know, we've heard reports you guys deliberated for two hours and 50 minutes. I went upstairs last night to figure out what was going on, and somebody said, yeah, we asked them if they wanted dinner, and they said, no, we'll be done in 10 minutes. So. I would be like, yes, please, please give me the free dinner. <laughs> it went fairly quickly for a six week trial. Tell, can you take us inside the room a little bit? Well, I will say that whenever. Yes, tell us what happened. We want to know. How did you guys decide in 45 minutes? You know, we had asked if we wanted dinner. We were actually rounding up our last few questions that anybody had. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that we already had an answer. It was more so that we knew that the questions that we had, we had answers to. We just wanted to talk through them and make sure they made sense. Mm -hmm. um, so we just needed that extra 10, 30 minutes. I think it was about 30 minutes that we actually took. Um, and it wasn't that, you know, we'd already had the decision, but we knew that we were right there at it. Um, so, did it, so the whole two hours and 50 minutes, what went on both, like in the beginning, like just going through the instructions or? Um, what I want to know is what questions they have and then what evidence do they replay over to convince the other three members? Are you going to get into that? Tell me, please. Well, we had a pretty good idea of what the instructions were just because the judge read them to us. But okay. um, I would say when we first got in there, what was important to us was just to see where everybody was at and make sure if everybody was on the same page, maybe we just need to talk through things, make sure that it all makes sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. But um, we did have a few that weren't on the same page. So mm -hmm. uh, we did like an anonymous vote at the beginning just to see where everybody was at. And once we found that out, um, we kind of just opened the floor for anybody who ever had questions and then we would talk through those. We had the evidence in the other room. So if we had questions regarding a certain thing, we were able to refer back and we just went one question at a time. We didn't want anybody to not be able to say anything, so we did take turns speaking so anybody was talking over anybody. If anybody left, we made sure to wait until they could come back. We didn't want anybody to be left out or anybody to miss any piece of information. Um, okay. I think that's all. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like it was contentious. At all. Um, Wait, I, mean. I think more so than somebody being dead set on one thing or the other, we all, I think, were very good in taking all the evidence and not jumping to any conclusions. But I hope Creighton's getting better sleep now and eating better food. But rather taking all the evidence and seeing where it led us. Whenever we got to the end and there were some people that weren't convinced, I don't think it was so much that they knew that he was not guilty as he, they just weren't sure yet. They didn't. They didn't. Might not have known qu answers to certain questions. So that's when it really took that two hours to kind of walk through something they might not understand. Go back to the evidence. Go back and see what somebody said about something, and answer those questions for those people. 
I think some of the jurors didn't understand the, oh, the casing evidence. Okay. Have you ever been a juror? Mm -mm. I've been in court before, though. Like I said, it wasn't that they knew that he was not guilty, but they just weren't sure, and they needed the answers to those questions, and we were able to get those. So it was like a nine to three vote, the first vote? Yes, it was. Okay. And then slowly, how many votes did you take? Um, we took one at the beginning. We, like I said, went through all the questions that anybody had, and then at the end we took another vote. And we not only took that other vote, but we went back through beginning to end about all the details and the facts just to make sure that you know somebody's story didn't differ from somebody else's. We were all pretty sure that we knew what had happened and we knew had, who had pulled the trigger. Um, so then we took a vote at the end and then we took a moment to gather ourselves. Um, we wanted to make sure that everybody was, they knew what they were going to say as far as what they thought and what their vote was going to be. We didn't want anybody to have any questions. We didn't want anybody to feel nervous about what they were saying or that they weren't sure and we wanted everybody to make sure that that's what they said because that's how they felt we didn't want anybody to feel peer pressured or like they had to say something yeah so with the um the the track that they found on maggie's leg i think initially they thought it was like a footprint or maybe like a like a tire track from like the atv um they went back and forth a little bit as to what might have happened to maggie's leg but um i think overall they just thought that uh her leg just like either just grazed upon the atv tire um they never mentioned that like, her actually getting ran over or anything like that because i think they mentioned that like underneath it uh there wasn't any bruising or any you know sort of like injury like that what were some of the questions that people had because obviously this was a six-week trial it was supposed to be three <laughs> and you weren't allowed to take notes yeah um it was very tough, but I will say that everyone in the jury pool, they paid very close attention. Um, that was actually one of our concerns towards the beginning, uh, was not having anything to you know take down notepads. But in the jury room, we were able to have uh, paper and pens. So if we had any questions, that's kind of where we would write down our questions, and we saved them all the way until deliberation. A lot of times, those questions were answered throughout the trial, so they didn't. Those questions didn't make it to deliberation because they were answered by another witness or somebody else. But we were able to write back there, so we would just have to, you know, wait for one of those 15 minute breaks and then jot it down real quick. Um, so that's kind of how we got through that of not having anything to write it down. That's really interesting. Um, what were some of the questions people had? I mean, were there some things that the three were thinking, did they have the same questions or were they just things they couldn't remember? Can you give me an example? Um, so I think that one of the questions were regarding kind of the, um, the gun situation, I think that there was maybe a couple people that weren't very familiar with firearms. So it was, and I completely understand, it's a little hard to understand how you can match a casing to a gun if you don't have that gun. And I think it was important to... Yeah, so like for example, if you're a juror member, right? If you're part of the jury and you didn't understand shit about firearms, even though you're not researching anything related about the case, are you allowed to like research about firearms and stuff like that or can you not research about firearms and you just have to any questions you ask you just have to ask the judge because what if you want to learn more about firearms to actually understand what the fuck they're saying <laughs> you know realize that they weren't matching a casing to a gun they were matching a casing to another casing that had been shot by the same gun and we knew that the gun that shot one of those casings had been seen by one of the witnesses mm -hmm. that paul was shooting that gun with his friend mm -hmm. so then you know that both those casings had been cycled through the same gun and that casing was at the crime scene so that's how you're able to place that gun at the crime scene and know that it's a family gun when you got out there and you you know did you look at him uh, what was that like so throughout the entire trial one of the things that i wanted to isn't doing jury in a criminal case risky? What if they get out and come for revenge? I'm pretty sure there's a movie about it. That's usually, I usually hear that with like witnesses, but sometimes they like tamper with like jury as well. It depends on like, you know, if you're like, if you're going up against like what, like a crime boss, mob boss or something like that, it could be really scary. Hey, Tam, how are you doing today? No research and the judge can't clarify evidence. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, when he spoke about the guns, I understood what he was talking about. Wondering why he shot her so many times. Because he just wants to look like... He wants to make the crime scene look like it was done by ruthless murderers. <laughs> ...to do, just because I felt like it would benefit me, is watch both sides 
both the prosecution and the defense and see what their reactions were to certain things that were said. So my eyes were constantly going from prosecution to defense to the witness. You know, I wanted to see everybody's reactions and how people were taking things, what their responses were. So whenever we got out there to, you know, express what our verdict was, uh, I wanted to watch and see how the defense and the defendant reacted. So um, I know that I'd heard somebody say that was in the audience that we never looked, but I know that for me, I looked at the defense, I wanted to see what the reaction was. Was there anything that stood out? I think that the only thing that stood out to me, and it, it wasn't shocking to me, but was that there was no reaction. It was just a straight face. Mm. The kennel video, what, how important was that to you? You tried Raman again? Yeah, Raman is uh, uh, like there, there's a lot of rest, a lot of Japanese restaurants that um, buy frozen ramen. Um, they like buy it from like a wholesaler. Um, like even the broth is frozen too. But uh, I mean, those are okay. But yeah, ramen, yeah, it's it's tough to get good ramen. I think even like in LA, I can't really find good ramen here. I had no idea about guns, how they work, and the trajectory of the shots. I would still have hold him guilty just because of circumstantial evidence. Uh, that's why the defense and prosecution will each have expert witnesses countering uh, one another's opinion. Overkill is a sign of passionate anger. He thought he he thought he thought everything. Oh, he thought that he thought everything through. And was it to you? Because it, 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 to me, it seems to be the biggest part, or at least one of the biggest pieces of the state's case. Um, I think it's a very crucial piece, and I think that it's incredible timing as to when they were able to get it and I think it's incredible timing on Paul's part. Um, I don't think that anyone would have ever known that he was down there if it wasn't for that video. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lot of evidence that points towards Alex but I feel like that does solidify it. Um, he can't you know, deny that he was there at that point because there's a video that places him there. Um, I think that it speaks a lot that somebody that couldn't speak, somebody that couldn't be a witness was able to be a witness even after they had passed away. I keep saying that the little detective, you know, gathered a piece of evidence to help in his own murder investigation. Right. You know, un unwittingly, you know, he didn't. I know how ironic that Paul's nickname was Little Detective. Uh, I refuse to pay fifteen dollars for a bowl of ramen. Yeah, you know, honestly, like the price of everything is just so expensive now. Like even paying like fifteen dollars for a bowl of pho, that's what the price is going for here in LA. I'm like, oh my god. But uh, I think ramen nowadays, it ain't even $15, like 18 bucks now. And then you got to order like your appetizers, your drink and all that stuff. Like, oh my God, it's so expensive. <laughs> You're surprised at uh, how many jurors actually have talked to the press. Firearms are, uh, no. firearms are seriously easy to trace the person using them isn't covering up his tracks or has little knowledge. Surely he could have gotten a hold of a firearm that wouldn't be traced to him. You know what, Wayne? That's why I think that he decided to murder Paul and Maggie that same day when he was confronted by uh, Jeannie. I think I did a poll and a lot of people thought that he was actually planning this out for a couple of days. But for me, I think he just decided that day because if he had to, you know, if he had time to plan it all out carefully, I feel like he would have just went out and just bought guns that the family didn't own. Like why, why use guns? Why use Paul's gun potentially, right? Why not just get guns that your family don't usually have? And maybe that would have made it look a little bit better for you. <laughs> Bring back 895 fall. Dude, when I was in high school, fall was like 525 for regular, 575 for large. Okay. And I remember I was like, oh my God, 575 for large. Yeah, right. I'm paying 525 instead. But now fall is like times three the price. It's wild. He was just trying to take a picture of Cash or a video of Cash's tail. Right. Um, were there other pieces of evidence that you thought were really critical? I think that every piece of evidence was critical. Um, you know, I've heard a lot about when was the point that you really felt like, you know, you were going to sway one way or the other. And it was very important to me to not make that decision prematurely. So I would say that I never made a decision until after both closing arguments. Man, I wonder one day if we're ever going to find that missing gun or those shoes or their shirt. You know how sometimes like people just find like dead bones like, you know, just laying around. I wonder one day if like if it's just going to be like, oh, my God, there's like there's some guns and there's like some bloody shirt and shoes here. What the heck? After I knew that I had all the evidence, I felt confident in making a decision because I think that if you make a decision before you're able to see all the pieces of the puzzle, you know, you may have jumped out, you know, you may have gotten in front of yourself. I think that 
for me, I am uh, familiar with firearms. So being able to place both of those guns there, and although it was not, the shot shells were not a match to either of the shotguns, it was very interesting that one of the shotguns that happened to be one of Alex's favorite was missing. Um, so that was kind of important to me. It was important to me that they could place both those guns there based off of the matched markings on the shot, shot shells and um, spent casings. Um, I'd say. Uh, listen to the 911 call. I didn't realize that it starts recording while ringing. You can hear the dogs bark, but he doesn't cry until they answer the call. Oh, I don't know if I ever realized that. I think it's both. He has thought about it for a long time, but that he decided that day, gotcha, that there was going to have to be the day, so that part was stress. Ah, uh, I see. No, they'll never find those guns. I'm most sure that he made them go away permanent. But how, though? What do you do? Just blast them into outer space or something? Now I can't get a beer for under six dollars. Beer, you can still get under six dollars if you go to like some really um like small like mom and pop places. I've seen beer for like um uh, there's this Vietnamese restaurant that had beers for like three fifty. <laughs> Say another piece of evidence that was important to me was his own, you know, his own uh, time on the witness stand. Um, it was just there was a lot of things that you were able to gather based off of what he said, how he said it how he was reacting. The gun is probably in the backwoods of his mom's house somewhere. Yeah, I want to know, like, when they executed the search warrant for the mom's house in Alameda, how far out did they extend that to? Like, did they go to, like, the backwoods area? Like, did they check it? Did he ever make eye contact with you? I kept uh, seeing him look over. I didn't know if he was looking at just a few of the jurors, or did you ever? So, like I said, I was constantly looking at prosecution, defense, and the witness on the stand throughout the entire trial. Um, being able to make eye contact with somebody is, I, I, I don't know why, but I'll make eye contact with people a lot, especially during the trial. And it was something that I noticed that he very rarely ever made eye contact with me. And I don't know if it was on purpose or if it was just because I always sat all the way on the end. You know, I was kind of away from the rest of the jury once we lost a few alternates. Um, but that was something that I noticed is just that we didn't make very much eye contact. Interesting. Did you see, um tears from him a lot of people I, I saw them sometimes but I, obviously I'm either watching on television or I'm in the courtroom and his back was head is to, to me mm -hmm. did you see tears um I yes I did I, I know that some people may have said that he did or didn't but whenever I like I said I watched a lot of people there was six weeks worth of time where I was just watching people and listening to people and I would say that there was several times that he was crying whether they were genuine or not I don't know but I would say that he was crying at certain parts of, of the trial. Did you believe anything that he said? Um, I think that he is, I think that he's good at being able to talk to people. And I think that part of the way that he is. Yeah, and look at the body language he's portraying right now, right? He's like, I'm six foot five, but I gotta make myself as small as I can. And like, oh, this is the victim stance right here. Like, this is the victim position. This is the gamer position right here. <laughs> Playing late night Call of Duty, bad posture. Able to be so good at talking to people is that he's convincing. And I think that whenever he's convincing, he's convincing himself as well. And I think he's able to do that because he often meshes the truth with a lie. Mm -hmm. So I think that there was some truth. And I think that it's true that he did love his family. And he tried to do the tactic where it's like, well, if I told the truth on this, you know, then that means I must be telling the truth about this, too. It's like, no, you can be selective in what you tell the truth in, right? Because he's like, remember how he like decided to admit all the financial stuff? It's like, okay, well, you admit it to that. Great. But it doesn't mean you're going to admit to something that's even more severe, which is which are the murders. Um, but I think that he also mixes his lies in there. And whether those, what those are and where you differentiate those, I'm not sure. But I think that at times he was telling the truth, and I think at times he was lying. Was there a Lost track of the channel after the Johnny Depp trial was so burned out. I just, look, okay, I was burned out too. <laughs> I was so burned out. I uh, love your videos, though. Happy to have found you again. Well, thanks for popping back in, Katya. Yeah, like when we do trial stuff, like it's fine. You guys are here. And then after the trial stuff, I feel like most of us are just kind of burned out like mentally. So I go back to just playing video games. I go back to doing vlog stuff and just stuff that I'm just like other things that I'm interested in. So it's it's totally okay. <laughs> specific point where you thought, I mean, obviously we know he was telling the truth about being down at the kennels, but maybe you felt obviously he didn't tell the truth when he talked about what leaving the kennels because I remember a specific portion of that testimony where Creighton Waters asked him 
well, what did you say to Maggie when you left the kennels? Or did you just get on the golf cart and go? Did, did, were you, did that, did you catch that? When he, and he said things like, well, I would have said, you know, if he were leaving the kennels, I would have said, did you pick Right, well, he was saying, he was saying, you know, I'm not, I can't remember what I said, but I would have said, you know. Yeah, so weird. Like, how would you not remember your last conversation? so wild <laughs> right i'm six foot five all day every day but five two when i kill <laughs> style that's like a t-shirt phrase uh did i see the shave head picture of him after book i did i was wondering why he shaved his hair well, I, I don't know that's why i thought like he had like maybe like he was going through chemo or something like that i was like oh this guy's like shaved his hair interesting uh kind of looked like uh walter is his name walter white from breaking bad when his hair was all shaved I would definitely believe he did this for financial gain, uh, really for the insurance on the property. You have to figure out how to pull it off with the case with the uh, housekeeper. Law enforcement should check the on-story date on the day he brought the blue poncho to his mom's house. Yeah, I don't know if um, OnStar or GM or whatever gave them that information. I, may, I feel like they were really selective what information they gave um, law enforcement. Oh, God. Sorry, guys. We're all over the place. Uh, life insurance on the maid. Where are you getting your information? He didn't have life insurance on the maid. You mean the housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, right? But he had like some sort of like uh, insurance on his property that if there was some sort of, uh, I don't know, I guess like injury while someone was working on the property, then uh, they would be reimbursed some life insurance money. Uh, I was burned out too after the debt V heard. Yeah, I stopped watching anything court related until this case. I wonder since they didn't search anything that night if he got rid of them the next day with the help of the brothers. I don't know. There was also that really interesting video where after the police had searched their house, um, the the brothers and like I, I don't, one of the brother and Buster like took all the guns out of the house. But yeah, I don't know. He likes to talk and make himself childlike even when he's sentenced the way he says I'm innocent. Uh, he didn't kill Maggie and Paul Paul. He's just acting so juvenile at that moment for sure. Uh, did you guys ever wa have viewing parties together into the depths of submarine murder on Netflix? Oh my goodness. Um, I just got a clip about that on my feed. It's this uh, group of people that talk about anime stuff and they actually did mention about that. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen it yet, <laughs> but uh, I heard about it. I think um, one of the true crime stuff that I watched, I don't know if it was like Mr. Was it Mr. Ballin? It might've been Mr. Ballin. Did he talk about it? But I heard about that. It's pretty wild. They didn't have life insurance on the maid. They had insurance to cover something happened on the property. They shaved it for him to prep him for for jail. Oh, okay. All prisons get a head shave for lice. Oh, interesting. Why not just give them like lice shampoo? <laughs> Brothers and Buster uh, knew what happened. Alex had his buddy Corey Fleming sued him. Isn't it interesting how one of the police interrogations, Corey Fleming is there as his like lawyer friend? Oh man, Corey Fleming like sitting there and just like listening to like. Oh, shit. The police are on to Alec. Oh, no. They're going to be on to me soon. Oh, man. I got to make sure Alec doesn't say anything. I feel like he should have hold ass. He should have been like, yo, Alex, GTFO. Let's get out of here. Stop talking to the police. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> the property he owns are waterfront and desert islands off the south coast, off the coast of South Carolina. He could have totally have dropped it in the water at any of those location. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're saying. He said, well, I would have said bye or something because I think they were trying to establish how much time he was down there after that video before he went back. And he was saying, well, you know, I would have said bye. I wouldn't have just halt, like hauled back to the house. Mm -hmm. um, he was like, yeah, I'll see you later or something. Again, I forget what your question was originally. But well, was there anything that in particular that stood out about that? It was probably a bad question on my part. Like, I, I just noticed that he didn't, he got really quiet when asked about, well, what did you say to Maggie? Did you say bye or did you just, he said something? It's because he didn't say nothing to them. He ain't say nothing to them. Like I'm out of here or something like that. I think that it was pointed out throughout the trial, well, particularly that portion of the trial that there's a lot of things that he was able to remember vividly and there was a lot of things that he was not able to recall. And that was something that I paid attention to because some of the things that he could remember vividly are things that I wouldn't remember tomorrow. And then some of the things that he couldn't remember vividly were things that I wouldn't forget in 10 years. So there's, and whether that's just a difference on what's important to who, you know, whether him and I differ on what we would find priority to remember or what we would kind of, you know, forget about, I don't know. I don't, I don't know every person in the world, but 
um, I found it interesting some of the th Well, at least he didn't talk about how dirty the carpet fibers were. Things that he was able to remember and some things that he was not. So was the test? Yeah, Lamb, he kind of does. I was thinking about that too in my head. Sort of does. And like has, it's because of the way he's dressed too. Testimony, <laughs> was his, him taking the stand, was that, did that kind of clinch it for you? I mean, were you, you said you didn't make up your mind until the end, until the closing arguments were finished. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, was that something major that really um, was part of your decision? Um, like I said earlier, I think that all the evidence, all the witnesses, they were all a major part of the trial. Um, whether one weighed more than other, I think that there were some things that you could kind of rely on a little bit better. Hey, Andrea. Yeah, do you have like an article or something like that? Someone mentioned that earlier. Is there an article or something? Whenever he did get on the stand, I know that it was very abnormal. Abnormal. I've never been a juror before and I've never sat through trial before, but I did know that the defendant taking the stand was very abnormal. Um, I wouldn't say that at that point that sealed the deal or anything. I just took what he said. I tried to weigh it both ways. I tried to see if what he was saying and if it was the truth made sense, mm -hmm. then that would make sense. But then I ran it the other way, and if what he was saying just didn't add up, then it didn't add up. So I tried to do that with each piece of evidence. A lot of it did not add up. I tried to run it both ways as to if it was true and if it wasn't true, if I could rely on it or if I couldn't, and then which one made more sense and which one you know, kind of how they were saying about the circumstantial evidence, did it all point to the same conclusion? Mm -hmm. You know, which one of these, whether it was the truth or whether it wasn't and wasn't reliable. Yeah, I forget which one uh, who brought up in closing argument. It was either Creighton or the other guy. And they're like, you know, you take all the cir circumstantial evidence. You can't take it all separately. You can't, like, have it separately. But, like, if you take all the circumstantial evidence together, does it point to one conclusion? I was like, oh, that's a good way of looking at it. Which one points to the conclusion and fits the story better? Mm -hmm. Did... How important was Dr. Kinsey's testimony? Oh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Kinsey was great. I would, he talked about a lot, and he's very knowledgeable. I would say that he was, you know, a very big part of the case, as well as, you know, a majority of the team. Um, I found it very interesting, some of the things that he talked about, just because it, were, it was things that I was interested in. Um, I think it was very interesting as to how he walked through the crime scene, things that he noticed, things that he really, you know, dug into, and things that really caught his eye. But, um, you know, whether he was extremely, you know, the biggest part of the case or something like that. I think that he was extremely important and definitely gave us a lot of good information. Did you ever... <laughs> you guys are good now. The trial's over. Well, we'll have to see what happens to the appeal and if the appeal goes through. But for now, you're mine. Let it rest, okay? <laughs> I feel like the prosecution was getting way too into the weeds with financial stuff. That's oh no, is this that sketch drawing? Oh my God, so embarrassing. Every time I, every time I see the sketch drawing, so I, I get so embarrassed for him. Something that we thought they were getting too into the weeds with. Did that bother you guys? Because sometimes you guys looked a little bored when, not you specifically, <laughs> some of the jurors. Um, I will say that I, it's a whole new experience for me just for yeah. the last part of that question. So I don't think that I was really bored um, a lot of times, you know, maybe I was a little uncomfortable for sitting there for a while, but I was still interested. I thought that, you know, it's a very interesting situation, very interesting case. I, I'm going to be real, though. When they, uh, I started getting a little bit hazy-eyed when they were talking about the, uh, the blood splatter, the gunshot residue. Yeah, like, when, there was, like, there was a day where, like, a bunch of those testimonies went up. I was just like, oh, my God, dude, this is so hard to, <laughs> this is so hard to comprehend. <laughs> so do we have it or do we not? Can we just get to it? Oh man, Eclecti, how's it going today? How are you doing? Alex lying about being there during the crime sealed his fate. There's no other believable reason to lie about something so important unless you were involved somehow. If the defendant testifies, there's less than a 1% chance for an appeal. Oh, really? Um, but as far as for what your original question was, um, I don't think they got too far into the weeds because they, I, I don't know, that's a tough one for me it to answer. Like um, so it was like, oh my it's God, all evidence, okay, yeah. you know, whether it was just for the motive, the financial stuff doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it's not a factor on whether he was behind the trigger or not to me. You know, that was something they didn't have to prove, they didn't have to prove motive, but they felt that it was important for us to, you know, see that evidence. So anything that, in my opinion, anything that they put on the table for us to hear, it's important to hear because the judge has made the decision that that's important for us to hear. So I personally don't think that they got too far into the weeds, um, but somebody else may think differently than me. Sure. 
The Murdoch Murders podcast with Mandy Matney is full of information they've been using in investigations since 2018. Who's using the information to make a movie about allies? Wait, there's a podcast just dedicated to this? How many episodes are there? Um, did you did you have any feelings about the lawyers on both sides? Did you think they were all good? Or, I mean, did you have any feelings on them, about them? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of respect for all of them. They all put a lot of hard work and time into the case. Um, I think I would respect all of them. I don't think that I had a favorite. I think that some of them definitely, you know. I, I, would, I would pick Jim over Harpootlian. <laughs> just had a different style of being a lawyer and being my first time, you know, sitting in the trial like that. It was just interesting to see how each one of them, what angle they took, how they worked through the case. So, you know, I, I just I have a lot of respect for all of them for putting so much time and effort into the case. You, most of you, went <laughs> to the sentencing today. Did you all decide as a group to do that? Yeah, so I think that a lot of us were tired last night. We spent a long six weeks. We weren't able to talk about anything for six weeks, mm. and that all came to a point last night. Um, I, th I want to know if the chicken lady is going to get an interview. <laughs> is the chicken lady going to be here? Harpoolian's too arrogant, in my opinion. He just throws, like, fits, you know? He's got, like, just those fits here and there. Um, did you guys see the sex work interview who said she was forced to hook up with Alec and he was abusive? It was on Fit News Channel. Mm -mm, I haven't read any of that stuff. All good things. Happy to hear another juror's opinion and experience during the case. Dick Harpoolian, the man, the myth, the well, Dick Harpoolian. I think that afterwards we all kind of decided that we'd made a very big decision and we did not want to jump, you know, out there and start talking to people. We decided that we just wanted to kind of chill out and go home for the night. Um, last night we decided that um, we were going to ask everybody. If nobody wanted to talk, nobody had to. If people didn't want to come to the sentencing, they didn't have to. But a lot of us did want to stand together. You know, we wanted to go there. We wanted to finish this out as a group. Um, I will say that all the jurors were very incredible people. And we all come from different walks of life. And we were able to bond over the six weeks. So a lot of us, you know, some of us had particular reasons why we couldn't be there. And it's not that anybody didn't want to stand together. We were all unified. But certain people just couldn't make it today. Um, but as a group, we did decide that we wanted to come back today. We wanted to finish out the trial. And then um, we would go from there as far as talking to anybody or, you know, we wanted to make sure that everybody was comfortable with it and nobody was getting out, you know, in front of themselves or in front of the jury. What did you think of what he said today? He said, I'm innocent. And Judge Newman kind of had this back and forth with him. Mm, Judge Newman had a great response. Um, I don't really think that... You know, I was just there to hear what he had to say, but I think that Judge Newman did a very good job of, you know, um, finishing out the trial, and I think that everything that he said was, uh, was a very good representation of Judge Newman, and I think that he had a, you know. Were you surprised that Alec didn't say, you know, I'm sorry for the things that I've done or anything? I mean, he didn't, he said, I'm innocent. I wouldn't, didn't hurt them or wouldn't hurt them. I mean, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, Ugh. he... Usually, uh, sometimes a defendant will throw themselves. Oh, those eyes are kind of scary. <laughs> you guys kept talking about his beady eyes during the case. In the mercy trial. Of court and, you know, ask for leniency or ask for the lightest sentence. He could have been given 30 years, but there was none of that. Did, the, did you have a reaction to that? Um, I came today to finish out the trial, and, you know, I definitely wanted to hear what he had to say, if he had to say anything. I didn't think that he would say anything. Um, I think that he, I thought that he may have felt like he had already said enough. You know, he had already said what he would or would not have done. Um, so I didn't really expect him to say anything whenever he did. I took it with a grain of salt. Your constitution tie, tell me about that. I mean, why, why do you have a U.S. constitution tie? Well, I don't really own very many ties, but my dad has quite a few. So at the beginning of the trial, um, I wanted to be a good representation of the community and my peers. So I made it a point to, you know, be rep be. Pre okay, he was dressing snazzy all day, every day when he appeared. <laughs> I would have shown my like sweatpants, you know. Ugh. Presentable and dress nicely every day. So you know, every once in a while, I'd throw in a tie, and this is actually one of my dad's ties. But I felt like it was very fitting for the, you know, trial. So I wear it or I wore it several times throughout the past six weeks and. I felt like today, with the end of it all, it was a very good day to wear something representing our judiciary system. Yeah. Well, you're a snappy dresser. I noticed <laughs> it every time I saw you in court. So, um, you know, I think that's great to show great respect for the court. Um, 
because there are sometimes people don't always do that. Um, James, is there anything else? Mm -mm, I wouldn't. I went to my friend's uh, birthday this past week and I showed up in like sweatpants and a t-shirt. <laughs> What's you like to add? And a hoodie. Um, I think that I have quite a few things to say. Um, Wait, who, when Alec was chubby, Mace? I think that there was a lot of people that put a lot of time and effort into the case. Um, I have a lot of respect for all of those people. I think they worked very hard and I worked, I think they worked very diligently. Um, I think that some things were, I think some people were put in some tight spots and they didn't want to overstep their boundaries, but they still were able to get their job done ultimately. And I think that came from a lot of help from Paul. Um, well, my solution to a wedding is don't go. <laughs> I think that as the jurors, we also did have a tough six weeks. Um, I think that a lot of credit from that would go to Faith. Um, I think very many times throughout the six weeks, we prayed together. We prayed before we went in. We prayed before we came out to give the verdict. Um, I would say that that was a huge factor in us being able to sit comfortably with our decision. Um, so you felt like God was maybe guiding you a little bit? Absolutely. Um, I think that having clarity of mind and just asking to, you know, allow me to be able to hear what I need to hear. Damn, I'd be the awkward one. I'd be like, oh, I'm not really religious, so can I kind of sit out on the praying stuff? I'll just sit on the side and eat my Cheetos, you know? Yeah, I mean, you saw some really horrible things. Did that affect you? Um, mm, oh, I think it would affect anybody. But I will say that whenever I'm sitting up there, I try not to think too much about myself. Wedding food sucks. I don't drink also. Wedding food sucks. I don't really drink. And wedding cake tastes like butt. <laughs> oh, um, there's only been like maybe one wedding I went to where the food was really good. And then one other wedding I went to where the cake was good. But for the most part, wedding cake is just it's just for display. And it's just like made out of like it's, I don't know, it's, it's gross because like they have to make it like days or hours ahead, you know. Um, and it has to last throughout the entire day. Oh, ugh. Self, and I try to think about what I need to be seeing. I know that these are important images that I need to be seeing so that I can take in all the evidence. You know, there might be something that I see that may stick with me, and although it may be gruesome, it's something that has to be seen for Paul and Maggie. Um, I also think that regardless, this is an incredibly difficult time for the family, and I hate it for all of them. Were you impacted by Buster testifying at all? Um, again, whenever I'm up there, I try not to think about myself or how I'm impacted. I just try to listen as closely as I can to everything that they're saying and retain as much information as I can just so that I can have the most honest and true opinion that I'm capable of having. So, you know, I can't say how I was feeling in the moment or what I thought. I was just taking every single word that they said and trying to pick it apart and make it all fit together and, you know, just really retain all that information. And you're feeling okay with, I mean, just, and I'm saying, you know, it sounds like you're very mature for your age, for 22. I mean, these are some horrible images that you guys had to see. I didn't get to see them. But you hear that? Any 22 year olds in my chat right now? Y'all are immature, okay? Y'all are immature. I can only imagine given what we were told was on the images. Um, how are you feeling? I mean, are you, are you, I know you're probably still decompressing from this. You know, we spoke earlier. I think that a lot of the jurors were going to need more time to just really get a grasp on that it's, that it's over, We've, we're done with the trial and now we have to get back to our lives. Yeah. Um, I think that it'll take a bit more time to really know how we're all feeling, but at the moment I'm just, you know, I'm secure in my decision and it's, there were definitely some awful things that we had to look at and that we had to see and some of those may stick with some of the jurors and all the jurors for a very, very long time. They were definitely not something that you see every day and something that you hope to never have to see or something that you hope never happened. Mm -hmm. But it's just going to, you know, take time for a lot of people, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, it must have been tough to look at the pictures, especially the pictures of Paul and Maggie um, and the autopsy photos, too. You love wedding food. For the most part, because, like, a lot of people do, like, the wedding food at the hotel, right, and the hotel provides the food. I feel like hotel food is, like, ugh. It's just, like, it's like chicken, steak, it's like cooked okay, you get a salad, it's all right. Like, I don't know, it's like, it's okay. Um, the one that I went to that was really good was a, a Filipino wedding. 
because it was a Filipino Hawaiian wedding. So they had Filipino food and they had Hawaiian food. Oh my God, that was so good. And it was like buffet style. I know typically people are like, oh, we don't like buffet style because it's like not very classy. You know, you need to have someone come serve you food. But the buffet styles are one of the best ones for weddings, in my opinion. I don't like going to sit there and have someone like serve you your food. And you said Mexican you know, wedding. you had to do this for Maggie and Paul. Do you, do you feel like you have a clear idea of what happened that night? Um, I do, just based off of the evidence and, you know, obviously there's some differing opinions from different witnesses and stuff, but um, I do think that being able to see all of the evidence, hear all the witnesses, and just seeing where everything played out, being able to go out there to the actual crime scene itself, and you're able to see how close proximity and you're able to see different little things that maybe weren't pointed out in, by any of the witnesses or any of the, you know, prosecution, defense you're able to kind of picture it and you're able to kind of see what happened. And that kind of goes back to earlier whenever you were asking if I think that he told any truth whenever he was on the stand. And I think that it makes sense for him to go down there on the golf cart. Um, I don't think that he went down there originally with them. So, you know, that's one of the parts of the truth that he, I believe, filtered in with most of the lie. Do you I think he went down with all of them, three of them initially. I think he went down with all of them initially. And then while Maggie and Paul were busy with the dogs and stuff, that's when he was like, you know, starting to load up and all that. Uh, are they allowed to take notes, like write stuff down while sitting in court? So in this trial, they were not allowed to take notes uh, while listening to the testimonies. But it depends on the trial. Sometimes the judge will allow it, sometimes not, I guess. Um, I honestly thought they would always be allowed to take notes because it's a lot to absorb. But in this one, the judge uh, did not let them take notes. I was at a wedding where the food was amazing. They had uh, champagne with rose syrup and it was amazing. Try it. Oh, man. I'm not a champagne person. The uh, MM podcasters live about an hour from Hampton and Bo uh, Beaufort, Beaufort. And they have so much information on this guy and all the buddies in their crime. Oh, interesting. Do you think he, you know, do you think it was true that Maggie wanted him to come and he said no? Do you think that when you say this guy, you mean Alex Murdoch? There was a confrontation about the pills. I mean, do you have any thoughts? Well, oh, yeah, that kind of goes to another question that you had asked earlier um, about him on the stand mm -hmm. and things that he said. So that was one thing that I kind of noticed is he's up there and he's talking a lot. Um, oftentimes, the prosecution would just let him run with it. Whenever he started to say something, they just wouldn't say much, and they would let him build on it and build on it. And whenever he was talking about whether she was going to come or whether she wasn't, he had mentioned that it had been, there had been prior testimony that any time that she was going to be going to the beach that she was going to be taking the dogs. Mm -hmm. So he used that and he said that she didn't have the dogs, so she was obviously planning on coming back to Moselle. Mm -hmm. But she was going to a doctor's appointment and I know that you can't take your dogs into the doctor's office and she's not going to leave them in the hot car. And she didn't have a Tesla too, because she would have, you know, Teslas have dog mode. So I don't really think that proves anything. And they were also having work done down there at Estoy. You don't want your dogs running around the house whenever you've got work going on down there. So there was just some little things like that that didn't really add up. You know, he was trying, I felt like he was trying to put something in there to solidify his story, mm -hmm. but really it was just kind of. It was making it more messy. A little bit more questionable. Mm. Do you think that Maggie was using the hose in the kennel video? And got the chicken from Bubba, or, I mean, do you have any thoughts on how, what you think happened? Um, you know, we don't, we don't have a dead set time on when everything happened as far as after the video. We know there's a period of time between whenever that video ends and whenever he picks up his phone at the house. Um, so who, I think that I hear a hose in the background whenever they're taking that video. And I know that Alec is calling for Bubba. So I do think that Maggie was probably washing out the dog pens, um, and I think that he was getting the chicken, and that was another part of his testimony is he was saying, you know, Bubba is running up to me. He's wanting to show me the chicken. He's wanting to give it to me. He's proud of it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you hear him holler for Bubba two to three times in the video. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really seem like he's, you know, running up to him. It kind of seems like he's having to call him to him. Um, and I know that I've got several dogs, and there are dogs that are happy, and they want to run around with it themselves, you know. Um, so that just small things like that, like I said, I was listening to every word and I was trying to just make it make sense. And there's some things that are just like, well, that doesn't really make sense with what I saw in the video or that doesn't make sense with what I heard here, things like that. Do you think he tossed the phone out when they think he did that night? Um, you know, I'm not sure. 
I think that he had the phone at some point in time, and there was a debate on whether it would turn on or whether it wouldn't. Um, and we have no idea how he threw the phone. We have no idea whether he was holding it in his hand the whole time and had it turned off. We don't know, but it makes sense to me for him to have thrown the phone. James, I, I don't want to keep you any longer. I really appreciate it. Um, anything else you want to add? Do you mind if I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think if he hadn't taken the stand, do you think it would be, like how did him testifying sort of affect things for you guys? Is it possible that maybe it would have left? I mean, could you see it have, it have be, be, been a not guilty verdict? No, no. Even though he didn't take the stand, it was already looking so bad for him and his team. If he hadn't taken the stand, I'm trying to kind of understand how that I played think into it. Stand, Did that like know. solidify things in your mind or? I think it was an aspect, and I think it was a part of the trial. But I don't think it was the make or break point, and I don't think that it was a situation where if he didn't take the stand, he wouldn't have been found guilty. Um, I think that there was enough evidence there gathered by SLED and produced by Paul that it was there, he was there, and I think that we all you know, had enough evidence there that whenever we went and deliberate, there was enough there whether he got on the stand or not. Without Good the answer. kill video, do you think there was enough there? I would be so bad on these interviews. I'd be like, uh, 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 <laughs> I would just word vomit a lot. I'm not sure because there was the kennel video. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, I made my decision at the end of the trial whenever I had all the evidence. So, you know, I'd have to go all the way back to the beginning and forget everything I knew and then go without the kennel video to be able to make that call. Um, there was a lot of evidence, and I just know that that was a part of it and a crucial part of it. And I think that who it was provided by. I'd be like, we all knew the motherfucker did it. <laughs> um, he was forced to take the stand because of how bad it was going. A lot of people don't realize that jurors can get a lot of awful cases. No, people realize. They realize how bad murders can be, child abuse cases. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, sometimes you're not sitting there just for civil stuff, right? Like you can go up there and judge someone like, oh, they robbed a store. That's about it. But no, sometimes you, you get murder cases. But yeah, it's tough. Uh, a friend got called for jury service for a second time. The first time he talked about it afterwards. The second time it turned out it was a child abuse case. I uh, didn't say a word. It broke him sad. Tough gig. Yeah, that's a tough one. I wouldn't be able to be on uh, a member of the jury, I don't think. I don't know. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be too tough. Spoke a lot. Did the Mo cell visit take you more toward guilty or not guilty and why? Um, so again, like I said earlier, um, I waited until the end to <clears throat> make my decision, but whenever I'm at the end and I'm you know, thinking about all this evidence, there was parts that I noticed at the Moselle property that you know, were evident to me that solidified my answer of guilty. Um, there was a lot of question about... So there was a, a lot of questioning about the second shot um, to Paul, and to me, the way that it was described and the way that it was portrayed, it just didn't look right. But what did make sense to me, and something that I'd made note of before we went to the Meslo property, because I didn't know that we were going to the Meslo property, but I was curious, um, is that for one, I think that he would have been looking at Paul. And whenever we get out there, it's a very tight room, and there is about a one to one and a half inch threshold at the base of that door. I think if he's looking at Paul, and he's just shot a buckshot, which if you're, you know, if you're not firm, it can rock you pretty good. I think he could have been unbalanced. Mm -hmm. And I think he could have tripped over that threshold and that puts him on the ground shooting upward as Paul's coming out. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes sense to me for the angle of the shot. Okay, and one, one more question. Um, is this okay, Amaya? Okay, um, why do you think he did it? Uh, was it the defense that, yeah, I don't know. The defense wanted the jury to go visit the Mozart property. Um, and then the prosecution's like, I think they didn't, they didn't really want to. They're like, no, we don't need to do that. But then the judge is like, yeah, well, let, let's, let's let them go. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they thought they were going to benefit from that. I think one of the question was, would Alec be able to hear the gunshots if he was at home? um and they were shot at the kennels right and i think what the defense wanted to do was to show how big the Moselle property was so maybe 
the jury can see like, oh, wow, this property is so huge. There's no way Alec could hear the gunshots from the house, potentially. But again, the feed room was like, apparently everyone said it was like really tiny, you know, to have like two people squeeze in through the door and to shoot from top down instead of bottom up, like what the state witnesses were saying. I don't know. I don't know what the defense was thinking. The other thing I was thinking, too, is like I was thinking maybe the defense was just trying to stall a little bit because they had to, you know, really work on their closing argument. And I think they were hoping that Harpootlian and Jim were be able to split the closing argument. But then the judge was like, nah, one of you guys need to do it. So I think they were just also stalling. So Jim would have more time to work on closing argument. I don't think like that. I don't I don't have the capability of thinking to be able to do something like that. So I don't think that I'd ever be able to answer why somebody would do something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a lot of contributing factors that somebody could throw in. Mm -hmm. And we heard a lot throughout the trial, but I still think there's more that we haven't heard and there still may be more that nobody knows about. I just Yeah, I agree with him too. Cause there, there are some people that popped up in the chat and they're like, well, I don't believe he did it because I can't imagine, you know, why anyone would do this for that motive. It's like, yeah. It's probably because you're not a, you don't have a mind of a murderer. <laughs> some people do some really dumb, fucked up shit for stupid reasons. And, you know, we may not be able to understand it, but it just happens. Contributing factors that somebody could throw in. And we heard a lot throughout the trial, but I still think there's more that we haven't heard. And there still may be more that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. I just think that, I think that it doesn't make sense to do that. But I know that there's people in the world that don't make sense and they do things without making it make sense. Yes. So I don't I don't know that there is an answer other than this guy also watches my stream. Well, not during the trial, after the trial. <laughs> that it happened and that it shouldn't have. I think we can all agree on that.